coming out at a very busy time in the semester. Um, we have with us tonight um, Millie Sersevius and the Hannah Arendt Center are presenting Professor Jens Hansen of the University of Toronto. Um, in Toronto, he's a professor of Middle Eastern and Mediterranean history. Uh, the talk tonight, as you all no doubt know, is entitled Translating Revolution, Hannah Arendt and Arab Political Culture. Uh, as you may have noticed if you read further in the bio, um, Jens is quite prolific. Uh, he, this is part of a larger project, as I understand it, on um, German Jewish and Arab intellectual life. But he's also um, got a whole other project that he's been part of for quite some time, thinking about the city of Beirut and urban history. And that's actually how I got to know him and his work, um, working on the late 19th century and, and the sort of urban intellectual life of, of Beirut. Uh, he is the author of um, Fantasia de Beirut, which is one of the books that uh, brought me uh, to him in terms of being a reader, um, as well as History, Space, and Social Conflict in Beirut, which he co-edited, um, which if you're interested in urban history, is a pretty fascinating take on the city of Beirut. Um, and then he's also co-edited Arab Provincial Capitals in the Late Ottoman Empire, and it won't embarrass you further um, than to say that he's also written quite a few articles, and there's a recent one, Critical Inquiry, um, that might be of interest to folks. Okay, so thanks for joining us. Thanks, uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for so many people for uh, emailing me and making sure that I, I get here from Toronto. Mm -hmm. Sam, Sydney, <laughs> and Helen for the library work. Bridget, I think, is responsible for the camera. Um, <coughs> Thomas Wiltz has, uh, has uh, invited me for lunch. Roger has been kind enough to put me into in touch with uh, Helen. And of course, to, to Beth, our work overlaps uh, with regard to the Arabic Renaissance. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to talking more about the gardens of, of <coughs> Nahda. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, <coughs> it's wonderful for me to be speaking about those two projects uh, sort of the German um, and Jewish intellectual uh, trajectories and, and, and Arab perceptions here, because it allows me to, to combine uh, my Arabic uh, literature interest, or Arab intellectual interest, uh, and <coughs> my uh, interest in uh, German and Jewish thought. Um, let me begin uh, by relating to you two uh, stories, nothing to do actually with the topic uh, at hand, it seems. They're more methodolo methodological allegories and that uh, address the problem that occurs when we apply <coughs> uh, Western thought to uh, non Western history. There is, of course, a, a, there's in fact a lot of resentment, I think, in the Arab world, especially today, after and during the Arab revolutions. Um, of a lot of people trying to make sense of what happens in the Middle East, referring back to people like Hannah Arendt and making sense. So I won't be doing that um, totally. Um, uh, I'm flagging this to say that I'm aware of the problematique. So two stories. One is a story by the great uh, Arab uh, historian Albert Horani, who's the reason why I went to Oxford, but he died by the time I, I, uh, I arrived, unfortunately, in 1993. When he was an undergraduate at Morden College, he was taught by R.G. Collingwood, the famous uh, and very influential uh, intellectual historian, historian of ideas. And he would tell him and his friend, uh, 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 Charles Esaoui, that they should read this book, and Dilthi, and Zimmer, and, and a whole long list of, of, of thinkers and sociologists. And Horani, at one point, according to his friend Esaoui, says, this is rubbish, I bet you Collingwood hasn't even read these books. And apparently, he broke into the study of Collingwood while he was in the senior common room and checked whether Collingwood had actually read the books that they were supposed to read for their PPE exams or for their PPE papers. Lo and behold, these books were there, but alas, they were uncut. They were still in an uncut stage. First story. The second story is more recent and it pertains, I, I was uh, attracted to it by, by a, uh, an article by somebody called Brad Hina who wrote about Michel Foucault's relationship to the Black Panthers. And he goes as far as to say that Foucault's switch from archaeological to genealogical method was in fact pilfered, or was taken from, and then excised from the record from the Black Panthers. And 
that is uh, the way in which he got involved in the prison industrial complex was in fact taken from his time in Berkeley in 1970. Um, Angela Davis and uh, George Jackson, Solid Art Brothers, and it he sort of then has this this sort of epiphany as he as he uh, pretends, but it's actually an act of plagiarism. Um, and this pertains exactly to the problematic that we have in front of us when we take a canonical figure like Hannah Arendt and a an event, a series of events in the non-West, and this sort of question: How do we make sense of it? Is it a matter of application, or is it something more? These are my preliminary uh, methodological uh, allegories. Now let me go to Cairo. Uh, in the spring of 2012, um, Fosul, quite a venerable uh, magazine of cultural criticism, issued a call for papers for their new issue on revolutions. Um, Fosul was started in 1980, and it made a name for itself uh, because it, it was a the entry point for many Arab intellectuals um, into literary trends or theoretical trends <coughs> in, in, uh, in the West. So they had translations of, by, of, of works by Walter Benjamin, Roland Barthes, Michal Bakhtin, Michel Foucault, Derrida, and many, many others, including Wolfgang Gieser, for example. And so for Sewell, issues this call for papers. Um, and is in fact, has, has taken one chapter of Hannah Arendt's On Revolution as part of its selections in this volume dedicated to the Egyptian Revolution. When, and I checked, there was no, when Fosun never really engaged with Hannah Arendt before. Uh, so I, I was sort of um, asking myself, well, why did the folks at Fusul at this uh, magazine uh, journal choose the 1964 translation uh, by Khairi Hamad over the much more recent translation, which was done in 2006 by one Abdullah al Wahab. One of the reasons I think is that Hamad is still revered, the translator of this uh, of, of on revolution, is still revered by those Arab intellectuals who remember the 1960s and were active in the 1960s. I got this on account of one uh, Arab intellectual, Lebanese intellectual, for us, um, So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk. Hopefully, I'll get to the the, the translation by Haim Hamad, that's my, my sort of end point. But before, I have a lot of uh, work to do to, to contextualize this translation and another translation uh, afterwards. Um, so for Sewell's editors, we printed only one chapter uh, of On Revolution. And they replaced Hamad's own critical introduction with the following very brief words. We think, and this is a quote, that Arndt's text benefits us in our potential to achieve freedom and illuminate the evolving ambiguities with similarly complex situations in history." End quote. Now, many of us, of course, uh, well, the people in the Arendt Center will know this, uh, perhaps not so much the Arab literature folks, but Arendt's um, chapter, The Meaning of Revolution, which was reprinted the translation of which was reprinted, is where she introduces you know, what revolutions are about, um, that some revolutions were about to fail because it involved a social question, or try to translate the social question into a political vocabulary. Um, she also made the claim, and none of this was very popular in the 60s, I would imagine, uh, that modern revolutions did replace the ancient cycles of renewal with radical new beginnings, but they also imagined a return. So revolutions are also a return to something, to a better past, uh, in a more authentic order. In this sense, the Egyptian political theorist, Mona Omashi, asserted that, quote, during the revolution, she wrote an article, uh, quote, the genius of the Egyptian revolution is its methodical restoration of the public wheel. Now, she doesn't cite uh, Arendt, but I think there is some, uh, something Arendtian in, 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 her, in, her, in her work here. Um, the, the Tahrir Square revolutionaries would have also um, 
I think, appreciated Arendt's idea that revolutions don't necessarily start out as fully fledged revolutions, but they can quickly become so. So in Tunisia, in Egypt, Libya, Syria, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, um, we first had reform protests for prisoner releases, demonstrations that turned into outright campaigns to overthrow the regime only after brutal and botched uh, regime responses. So this article then is an, is an exercise uh, in simultaneously reading uh, Arab political culture with Hannah Arendt and reconsidering the more radical implications of Arendt's work in the wake of the Arab Spring. And what connects, I call it the Arab Spring only when I speak, I, don't, I use Arab uprisings, um, um, but what connects the Arab Spring and the, uh, and the work, and in particular on revolution and other uh, works by Arendt, are questions of democracy, spontaneity, violence, authoritarianism as a form of the lesser evil, and, the polit and politics as freedom. And I think um, in order for my work, this article to make sense, and I won't go into it uh, here, I have felt I needed to compare <coughs> Arendt's liberalism, which I call an insurgent liberalism, with the liberalism of others, other thinkers of her time, including, or perhaps above all, uh, Isaiah, Ber uh, Isaiah Berlin. And unlike these uh, think thinkers like Isaiah Berlin, Arendt time and again stepped out of what um, perhaps one of her best Israeli readers, Ayal Weizmann, calls this Panglossian liberalism of fear. <clears throat> now, Arendt was hardly innocent of some of the condescension that so defined Berlin's and others, salon, other salon liberals' blindness, if not outright hostility, to the world beyond European culture. But whatever her shortcomings, Arendt experimented. She raised painful questions that her fellow travelers shied away from, or that more recent lesser evilists, as I call them, have abandoned. And I have in mind, in particular, uh, my fellow Canadian, uh, Michael Ignatieff. But I, I won't go into, uh, into his work. I don't have time. Um, now, the Arab uprisings of the last two years appear not to have brought the desired new beginnings. But they've certainly severely challenged the old ways. The dusk has not yet fallen on the Arab Spring, and so it's clearly too soon for Hegel's Owl of Minerva to spread its wings. But what I think I am, can be confident in doing is to commit to the historical record this spontaneous moment in which <coughs> the, Arabs, uh, the Arab calls for bread, dignity, and social justice upstaged precisely the, the liberal, the, the, the um, lesser evil conventions, um, both in liberal democracies as well as authoritarian regimes. And I think the best place to start, or, or, or the place where the Arab Spring and Hannah Arendt's work sort of some ways are connected, is her account of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. In spite of its brief duration, she considered those 12 long days so powerful and indeed eternal because they were the first instantiation of the very possibility of defeating a seemingly unassailable regime. Many of her emancipatory concepts, such as the, the power of spontaneity and the exercise of freedom, derived from her purpose to curate the legacy of Budapest in 1950 quote from, uh, from uh, her work on, on, on the uh, Hungarian Revolution, this event cannot be measured by success or defeat. Its greatness rests in and is secured by the tragedy which unfolded in it. End of quote. Now, one revolution is controversial for many reasons. Um, most of all, perhaps, because of her embrace of council democracy, uh, Heiter, uh, 
Demokratie. Now, for a political philosopher who is so keen on transmitting the Western intellectual tradition in the aftermath of Nazism, and for whom political responsibility was so important, it is surprising how much Arendt was invested in the unpremeditated political gesture, exemplified by her embrace of spontaneity and council democracy. So she sees Soviet Hungary, or the, or the 12 days of council democracy in Soviet Hungary, as a heroic revival of that lost tradition of her revolutionary workers, soldiers, and neighborhood committees. Not so much workers' committees, more neighborhood uh, committees that popped up again and again in history. Thomas Jefferson's ward system, the Paris Commune of 1861, the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917 and the Central European Council Republics after World War I. So she holds dear this, 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 this idea of, of council uh, democracy. Uh, and a lot of scholars find it, in fact, irresponsible uh, <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and, and have questioned the validity and, and the long-term workability of Aaron's theory of council democracy. Um, I'm, of course, heading towards making this argument uh, that we have something similar, uh, had something similar in Egypt and elsewhere in, in, the, in the Arab Spring. But before I get there, uh, I should remind myself uh, that where, in fact, Arendt picked up this idea uh, of council democracy uh, in the first place, um, and following a footnote, that's what I do as an intellectual historian, uh, of Sheila bin Habib's, I think, um, I have I'm making the argument that Arndt's idea on council democracy was or were translations of her own vision for a binational future for Palestine, which she first articulated in her regular comment, uh, column, This Means You, in, in Aufbau, the New York-based uh, 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 newspaper for, for German speaking Jewry. She was abhorred by the prospects of the creation of a Jewish state at the expense of the native Arab population. And she invoked the lost local and municipal uh, traditions of government, where councils would, quote, become the sites of Jewish Arab cooperation. Now, she may have had an exaggerated view of, of what you know, these baladiat were, in fact, pretty elitist uh, institutions, a place where notables uh, determined um, uh, who was going to get sewage and who was going to get, uh, who was going to pay taxes. But municipal councils did develop into effective checks on state authority in late Ottoman cities and towns, in Palestine but also elsewhere that I've studied. Now, the fact that history has not been kind to Palestinians and buried Aaron's alternative vision for Palestine under the rubble of a six decade long occupation raises the issue of the efficiency of violent, either violent or non-violent Palestinian resistance. And there's another trajectory that I'm not going on today, but certainly it's interesting to, to pursue uh, the question of, of violence uh, in uh, Palestine. So here I'm more concerned with the conceptual question of the afterlives of ideas and theories once the context and the constellation in which they were first articulated uh, has vanished. Edward Said, of course, calls this process traveling theory. And I, I do find it useful uh, in order to prob problematize this compulsive transference of liberal democratic models to the Arab uprisings. And whether Western <coughs> pundits or Islamist ideologues make this argument, both do. Um, this move puts the uprisings into a place of perpetual derivativeness or derivation and inauthenticity. Days before the application of Mubarak, I have made the argument that we were witnessing an attempt at decolonizing the concept, history, and practice of democracy. And that the longevity of authoritarianism 
is in fact Western democracy's poisoned chalice to the Arab world. And so in this spirit, my paper, the Translating Revolution, is as much about articulating the place of Hannah Arendt in the Arab world as it is about how the Arab uprisings can re-energize Arendt's work and more generally posit her, what I've tried to call insurgent liberal thought, against the prevalent liberalism of fear. How are we doing for time? pressing ahead to get to the actual translation by Heidi Hamad, but I want to insert just one more sort of conceptual point, and that is the question of, uh, of violence. Um, uh, now, Hannah Arendt has, of course, written on violence in 1969-70, uh, and that, that essay was in many ways an adjunctive to her earlier essay in defense of civil disobedience. And she generally takes a dim Camusian uh, view, I think, of violence and the destructive force of violence, especially subaltern uh, violence. The militant student movements, the Black Panthers, the irris apparently irresponsible glorification, um, and also of uh, Franz Fanon's rhetorical excesses. Um, and I think she was blind to the structural and epistemic uh, violence that colonialism uh, has inflicted on most parts of the world. But she was anxious to distinguish authentic from gratuitous acts of violence. I think I want to stress this, or let's put it this way. The Arab Spring has encouraged me to stress, uh, to stress this. In a footnote, here we go again, um, to a passage aimed at Sorrel's and Sartre's apparent celebration of violence, violence per se as such, Arndt conceded, quote, that Fanon himself is much more doubtful about violence than his admirers. Fanon knows about the unmixed and total brutality which, if not <coughs> immediately combated, invariably leads to the defeat of the movement within a few weeks. And this last uh, passage was, in fact, a quote. She was quoting Fanon, approving. So Arndt's surprising generosity towards Fanon in this passage. Um, I mean, surprising because, of course, Fanon conjured up uh, colonial violence as an emancipatory, as a creative act, um, does suggest that, that Arendt, even in 1969, could not, well, with, in the context of, of this, the student movement and, and, and that she was very ambivalent about, she could not quite abandon late in life, what she had held dear during and after World War II. Her writings on the French resistance, the Danish refusal to deliver Jews to the Nazis, or the idea of a Jewish anti-fascist fighting force for Europe. Not, not, not for Israel. That was Irgun and, and those terrorists. So uh, I would argue then that Arendt allowed for revolutionary violence as long as it remained spontaneous, ephemeral, and got to be replaced by a higher order in which politics reigned supreme. For, as she argued, and I quote again, the point is that under certain circumstances, violence, acting without argument or speech, and without counting the consequences, is the only way to set the scales of justice right again. End of quote. Unusual quote. I, uh, I must say that I'm reading on the margins of, uh, of uh, at least Aaron's reception in, in Europe and perhaps the United States. As we shall see, hopefully, um, the revolutionaries of the Arab Spring struggled against this dual Orientalist stereotype of either the Arab as a terrorist uh, or the docile. They saw the disarming tactics of their non-violent protests brutally crushed by authoritarian regimes. The ubiquitous calls of Silmiyan, Silmiyan, peacefully, peacefully, on the streets of Cairo, Benghazi, Homs, and Sana'a, were drowned out by the cavalry, artillery, and helicopter gunships of the old regimes. 
until they themselves, the revolutionaries, had to resort to sabotage, armed struggle, and partisan warfare. To Arendt, who famously considered pacifism devoid of reality, the distinction between the two forms of violence would have been crystal clear. That is to say, the sabotage of partisan warfare versus the gun trips. As she tended to side with, quote, the partisan against the machinery of state power. Of course, she was deeply impressed with the resistance to Vichy France, which was conducted by underground, oh, which was <coughs> conducted underground by outlawed citizens, like the poet René Char, who, quote, without noticing it, the, the, the resistance, uh, without noticing it, had begun to create that public space between themselves where freedom could appear amidst the collapse of France. And you may be getting, uh, you realize where I'm getting to that, in fact, what you had on the 18 days of Tahrir Square and elsewhere, even in Syria today, uh, despite the mayhem, the collapse of Syria, the tragic collapse of Syria, it is these outlawed citizens who, who in fact create this space uh, of, of, of freedom in their, in their clandestine uh, and violent resistance. Now, I, I, I cut out a, sec a section on uh, Edward Said and Hannah Arendt, which I think is fascinating to me. Um, something that I only realized lately is in fact that um, uh, Edward Said was probably the first uh, uh, Jew after uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem who seri took seriously Hannah Arendt. He of course famously called himself the last Jew uh, in an interview uh, just before his uh, in, 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 in the late 90s. So it's, what, I, what surprised me is that many of the, of the Israeli scholars and intellectuals who rehabilitated, um, who re rehabilitated Hannah Arendt uh, in 1999, 2000, around the time that Eyal Sivan's uh, The Specialist came out, were influenced or had in fact translated parts of uh, Edward Said's work. I'm thinking of the Hebrew translation of Orientalism by Gabi Peterberg. And Said, of course, very early, as early as 1973, had made that pitch, which in some ways is Arendtian, that Jews and Arabs in Palestine are, are bound to share this land, um, you know, hook or crook, uh, that the more they fight each other, the more they tie to each other, in a famous uh, piece in um, uh, the Journal of Palestine Studies. Now, but um, the reason why the Palestine uh, the Palestinian context is important for my for my work is also because many, actually generally, most translators of these texts, uh, German and Jewish texts, often from French and from English, some the early ones from the Russian, uh, are done by Palestinians. The Palestinians are probably you know, I don't know by what by what um, mathematical equation, but there's an undue proportion of, of, of um, Palestinian translators of, of the kinds of works that I've been reading. Um, and Haile Hamad is no exception. Um, so let me turn to Raif uh, Thorat, that is sort of an opinion on, on revolutions, literally translated. It's, it's a translation, a very accurate and, and loyal translation of, uh, of On Revolution, uh, published uh, in Cairo, in 1964, I think, just a year after the original came out, and a year before uh, RN translated it uh, on revolution into German. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting that it's sort of, there's a contemporaneity there. Um, and I love his introduction. I read translations really mainly because of the introductions, because uh, they really make a translation into a historical document. And I am, um, uh, sad by the fact that today most uh, introductions, <coughs> for example those done by Saki Books in London, don't have an introduction anymore. And there's a whole sort of, uh, 
thought behind why that could be and what the negative consequences of this uh, decontextualization uh, are, is. Um, so the Palestinian, this Palestinian translators, uh, translator has, has, has quite a precocious sense of equality and affinity with art. And I think it empowered him to extract the worldview of the original text and imbue it with his own context. Now, Hamad was a widely respected public figure and a member of the quite an illustrious group of, of Palestinian humanists that included Abdurrahman Bushnag, uh, more about this, another Aran translator, translator of uh, between past and, uh, and future, uh, ten years after. It included the American University of Beirut historian, Nicola uh, Ziade, the novelist, artist, and Shakespeare translator, Jabba and Jabba, and many others. They all went to school at the Arab College in Jerusalem and then studied at AUB uh, and or Cambridge. By the time of uh, Hamad's death in 1920, uh, 1972, he left over 100 studies and translations of modern classics on literature and politics, including translations of Machiavelli, Oscar Wilde, Ernest Hemingway, Charles de Gaulle, Nehru, even Anthony Eden, uh, Hal Glusky, and uh, Morgan, Morgan Powell. Henry Morgan, that is. Now, in, in On Revolution, I mean, there's, there's a whole section also on, um, on translation theory uh, and, and the difference that he makes between Tarib, Arabization, and Tarjama, translation. Uh, and it's, it's relevant, I'll just touch on it briefly here, um, because the Arabizer, the Mu'arib, is that he is, that he says, I'm not just a translator, not just someone who transfers knowledge from one language into another. I'm actually an Arabizer. And this, this is, is a, a way of, um, uh, for him to, 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 to imbue a text seemingly alien, certainly by in terms of language, to, to his own situation, but to bring it, make it, make it urgently, uh, make it important in, in in his context. Uh, in another uh, introduction to his Eden translation, uh, Eden's uh, autobiography, he says, quote, in our current age, we need this transfer urgently, for we're trying to travel in one single year where others have traveled for decades. It will be enough only if we aspire to all the achievements of the civilized nations. And of course, now it's of course a, it's always a painful quote uh, because it bears the scars um, as well as the premature optimism of decolonization. For the idea of a shortcut to civilization and the very discourse of, civil, uh, of civilization itself is fraught with the kind of objectification that Fanon and Lukács and other people have talked about. But in the introduction to, um, to On Revolution, he sort of redeems himself in a way. Throughout the text, and in footnotes in particular, 100 footnotes, Hamad voiced his disapproval of Arndt's uncritical view of the West in general, and the United States in particular. Yet, he was impressed by what he considered Arndt's fair, subtle, and meticulous treatment of revolutions. And this is a, a, a staunch Nasserist. Right, who, who's, uh, who uh, you know, and, and believes in, in progressive socialism. So he credits Ara nevertheless, despite her shortcomings as a liberal, um, because um, there is nothing that links the traditional bourgeois and the progressive socialist world except a small isthmus of liberal thought and the new sense of liberalism, of being free of the shackles of dogmatism, whether on the right or the left. And this is the isthmus that, that uh, according to Hamad, um, Arendt has walked in her work and in particular in, on revolution.
Now, Hamad's footnotes, or in fact his, his footnoted translation, expresses this gulf of experience. Maybe I should proceed, um, say something else first. And this is how they differ on socialism, of course. He thinks yeah, there's a necessity uh, of socialism, whereas, of course, aren't neither like socialism nor necessity uh, as a concept. Um, but um, uh, we have to find, we have to sort of identify the, the positionality of the two authors, or the author and the translator. According to Hamad, not only have, quote, socialist countries been effective in combating poverty, but the third world, where white minorities have ruled since the onslaught of colonialism, the time for indigenous majority rule had come. And it's in this, in sentences like these, that express, I think, quite vividly, this gulf of experience that separated the post-colonial world from the post-totalitarian Europe. So Arendt writes as a minority victim of the violent passions of majority rule, white Nazi Aryan rule. Hamad's comments, on the other hand, represent the hope that after decades of minority rule by colonial and local elites, a revolutionary Egypt would finally emancipate the oppressed majorities of the population in the wider Arab world. So that's sort of that difference between you know, the post the majority minority mapping onto the post totalitarian Europe and post colonial uh, Arab world. Of course, Hamad is also very sensitive to Arendt's uh, total disregard of the plight of the black and the native populations of North America. And it makes quite a passionate appeal for having, we have to remember uh, this genocide. And as a displaced Palestinian, and a prolific uh, translator of other books uh, of the English language, Hamad was in a position to both empathize with the victims of the American genocide and articulate the injustice committed against fellow indigenous populations. And so at one point he muses, he has a footnote. And, um, Hamad has a footnote and says, and writes as the martyr, the, the Arabizer, it is a strange phenomenon in all American writing. They talk about their land as if it was empty and not inhabited by an indigenous peoples. End of quote. So in sum, I sum up with, uh, with uh, Heidi Hamad's uh, treatment uh, here of, of Aaron's revolution. I think he, he elevates this translated book from merely sort of literary copy, copy of an original. There's another section on, on the task of the translator, of course, Benjamin is, is, has helped me sort of theorize that relationship. Um, so from a mere copy to a historical document, he produced an original intervention in anti-colonial scholarship. With Hamad, we witnessed the subversive appreciation of the value of utterly Eurocentric political thought by moving away from questions of reproduction and application to more Saidian traveling theories or, 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 or elaborations is a term he used to uh, like uh, of canonical knowledge or current of countryism, if you will. Now, uh, what's my time check? Uh, maybe I should... Uh, okay, good. I want to not so much I won't talk about this next uh, translation in so much detail. Um, in fact, it doesn't have any footnotes, uh, nor does it have an introduction where I can get my, my historian's teeth in. But it's interesting for another reason, and it chimes with your um, uh, new work on uh, uh, the Cold War and Arabic uh, literary production. Between past and future, eight exercises in political thought of 1961 was Hannah Arendt's favorite book, says Thomas. Well, I think that's, I got it from your audio book, from the Har Hannah Arendt. Uh, uh, that she liked this book most of all of her work. 
And it's the only other of, of, of her books that was translated into Arabic before the end of the Cold War and also before the end of the Lebanese Civil War. Those two events, of course, collided in 1990. Abdurrahman Bushnak's Bain al-Mahdi wal Mustaqbal, 1974, was a straight translation without any introduction or additional footnotes. The value of the text for my purposes here lies in the few glimpses it gives into the origins of the project that the book's cover and first pages reveal. Unlike Hamad's independent and critical translation of On Revolution, Bushnak's was an authorized translation. Says on the Dr. One Dr. Zakaria Ibrahim, a Sorbonne trained professor of critical theory at uh, Cairo University, served as the supervisor of this project. And the flap further discloses that the book was published, quote, with the cooperation of the Franklin Foundation, Cairo, New York. End of quote. So I was intrigued. What is this Franklin Foundation? Anybody heard of the Franklin Foundation? Not Benjamin Franklin, I went all the way to. Have you heard of it? Yeah, it's, it's long dead. I, I'm going to say a little bit about it. It's, it's interesting, precisely for the reason that I think you're interested in some of the CIA sponsored journals. Um, so, who was behind it? What came to be known as the Franklin Book Programs was launched at a meeting of the American Library Association's International Relations Committee and the American Book Publishers Council's Foreign Trade Committee. It was launched in 1951. This, uh, this non-profit project made accessible over 3,000 American works for developing countries over the next three decades. The idea was to professionalize local publishers and distributors to involve leading intellectuals from these countries to advise and choose which books were most suited. So not a top-down approach, but sort of a common conversation. Arabic was the first language the program targeted and the first office in the Middle East opened in Cairo. Its director, Hassan Galal Arousi, was supposed to quote, and I'm quoting from a wonderful article by uh, some of you for library news, um, uh, quote, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Egyptian director was supposed to take the challenge of communism to the book stands. During the free offices Egypt, during Mossadegh school. There's also a Tehran branch that opened uh, around that time, a year later, maybe in um, So by the time the Cairo office of the Franklin Book Project contacted Professor Zakaria Ibrahim, many years later, I'm talking 74, um, to oversee the, the, the translation of Between Past and Future, the American members of the board of directors had become disillusioned with Washington policymakers' mistrust of the project, because the people in Washington didn't really like its insistence on local contacts, and they didn't like the bad press this project received from intellectual circles in the Middle East, so it lost both ways, I guess. Um, and so shortly before its dissolution, uh, in 1978, one board member lamented, alas, or our, shall I say, hidden fight against communism has not produced the effects we all wanted." Uh, end of quote. But of course, uh, I hasten to add that the Soviet counterparts uh, of, of this um, sort of act of public diplomacy also probably wasn't very successful uh, in, in translating perhaps Marx and Lenin into Arabic. Um, you know, if the goal was to, to stem in the tide of capitalism in the Middle East, in the 1960s and 70s, theory traveled in two directions. On the one hand, Marxist and tricontinentalist texts traveled to the Middle East as Arabic revolutionary manuals, or Arabic translations of liberal classics were read, particularly by Lebanese former Marxists, with a view to diagnose the internal contradictions of their societies and to account for the persistence of human unfreedom. So on the one hand, you have texts that were far from being Moscow-approved, so the 
tricontinentalist literature, on water being translated in pamphlet form, some argue in Palestinian refugee camps. On the other hand, you do have a, um, the emergence uh, of an interest in Hannah Arendt at the moment in which sort of Maoism seems to be uh, sort of peasant revolution, and in fact the very category of people seems to go up in, in the smoke of the Lebanese uh, civil war, and sectarianism and Amalayan. So um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll close here. Um, I sh should have wrapped it up perhaps more, more fully in relation to uh, the Arab uprisings, but um, I think that will open up uh, too much. And I think at the beginning I've already talked a little bit about how um, Arendt uh, is in fact, um, is it, uh, Arendt's work benefits from the Arab uprising. Uh, and some of her work, some of her more radical work, in fact, can be seen in a new light, uh, precisely by examining the kind of spontaneous uh, sort of acts of the of the uh, Arab uh, revolutions. So um, I'll leave it here. Perhaps can draw on on sort of the Arab uprisings in, in the Q and A. I think. Uh, what are you next now? I think I'll, I'll uh, thread it into my, my response. Okay, thank you. Thank you.